you remember last week I told you to put your seatbelts on? I'm going to tell you once again, put your seatbelts on. Because we're going to get into some stuff today. But believe me, it's truth. I, I preach it in love. And hopefully through this, we can grow together. Amen? Going to the next level. Let's put the next slide up there, Ashley. This is what we've been talking about. Lesson one, we talked about the fact that growth is a command. It's not an option. Lesson number two, this is where we've been parking it the last couple of weeks. We were talking about how growth is a process. You don't just wake up one day and you're at the next level. The next level doesn't take you by surprise. It's a process. It takes time. You're going to have to go through some stuff to get there. But we broke it down last week. Three things I want to discuss. Now, the first one we were able to touch on last week. And let's put that next graphic up there. Last week, we talked about the Simon Peter example. We broke down the life of, of Peter, and we talked about how he went from Simon to Peter. And we talked about the whole exchange there in Matthew when Jesus called him a rock. And then in the same chapter, he let it go to his head, and he actually rebuked Jesus. And so we talked about the transition that Peter had to go through. It was a process. Jesus called him a rock, but it took a few years for him to really get to that solid leader in the church that God had called him to be. So we talked about that. If you weren't here, I encourage you. Uh, we'll have the YouTube video up this week. We still got the live stream video. I encourage you to watch that. This week, I want to talk about these next two. And I probably won't get out of these two. The, the first thing I want to talk about is you can't take everything with you. And then I'm going to talk about stop being a victim. But let's look at Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at these first two verses. We'll read this, we'll pray, and we'll jump into this. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. says, don't be children anymore. Because if you are children, you'll be tossed, you'll be carried with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men, by the cunning craftiness of men, whereby they wait and lie to deceive. Verse 15. This is what he says, don't be children, but this is what you've got to do. Speak the truth in love that you may grow up. It's God's will. It's God's command. Basically what that is saying is the Lord wants to get you to the next level, but there is a process. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing that's here, that was here during the worship, ministered during the dance, and you just been ministering throughout the service the recognition of some special kids and our new members we thank you for all of this lord but lord we got a transition now it's time to declare the word and i ask that you grace me today with your anointing to teach to preach to minister lord direct everything that i say lord take everything that's in my heart and my mind and what's on these notes and let it come out exactly the way you want it to come out but Lord, I pray you anoint ears to listen and hearts to receive. Let your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Lesson two, it is a process, but you can't take everything with you. This is tough. I mean, when you think about trying to go up a flight of stairs, you realize that the more weight that you have on you, the less likely you are going to be able to succeed and going up to that next level. Talk to people who climb mountains and they'll tell you the air is much different at a higher altitude than it is lower in the valley. People who climb, people who rock climb, people who climb mountains will tell you that the higher you get, the weightier your baggage becomes. Some of you, I want you to hear me today, and this is the Lord. Some of you are going to have to realize not everybody can take the journey to the next level with you. Even people that have been with you up to this point in life, they cannot take the journey with you. Why? Listen, I love you. But there are some people holding you back from getting to the next level. People you can continue to love, but you're going to have to love them from the level God called you to be at. Because this is what you're doing. Either because of fear intimidation, anxiety, 
Maybe a fear to let go of things God's telling you, you got to let go of. Listen, you don't let go of love. You don't let go of memories. But you got to let go of whatever it is that's connecting you with somebody, keeping you to going where you need to be. And so you're going to have to let go of some people, some relationships, and you're going to have to let go of some stuff. Mindsets and mentalities and in addictions or things. Desires that you have in your heart that as you grow in the Lord, the Lord's saying, it's time to get out those scissors and start cutting some things. See, when you get to the next level, you handle your time differently. You handle your passions differently. You handle your attitudes differently. You have a different perspective in life. You have to have a kingdom perspective. There's so many people in church that never make it to the next level because of fear. They don't want to let go. They don't want to let go of what is familiar. They don't want to let go of of what has brought them comfort. And it, it, it is. It's comforting for us to continue to go back to things that we feel is safe. Relationships that are safe. Areas of life that feel safe. Things that we've allowed into our life that feel safe. But I'm telling you right now, and I'm going to prove this today, you cannot go to the next level until you get to a place that you realize it is time to let some things go and to let some people go. Now listen, before some of you get all passionate and pull out the scissors and start cutting off things that God didn't tell you to cut off. That's the key. This will let you know if you're walking in wisdom or not. The Lord will give you the wisdom. He will not leave you. He will give you the understanding necessary to let you know exactly who it is that can't make the journey with you and what it is that can't make the journey with you. He'll let you know those things. But you can't do it. Let me ask you some questions as we dive into this. Do you feel like you're growing? What a simple question. Look at your walk with the Lord. Now, some of you have been serving the Lord for two years, some five, some of you 20, some longer. Are you really growing? For somebody that has been a saint for 25 years, are you really growing? Or did you grow those first five years and the last 20 years you're just coasting? So are you really? Now, when I say, are you growing weekly, monthly, yearly? Can you look back at a year ago from now and really be honest with yourself and say, I am much more mature now. Maybe not in every area because God's a God of order and he deals with things according to how we can take it. But are you growing in areas in your life compared to a year ago or even before that? How about this one? Are you doing, and this is what I want to touch on in this point about you can't take everything with you. Are you doing everything necessary in order to grow And this is where the rubber meets the road because fear will overtake us the moment we get to the place. I mean, it's exciting. Listen, when we're in church and the anointing's flowing and the presence of God is here, this is a whole different environment than when you go back home. You go back home, you go back to your job. You know, it's it's amazing. You know, I I, I mean, I don't know. People do this. They get all juiced up at church service. People get all juiced up at New Year's. You know, Nutrisystem and everything else is, is selling, selling off the shelf. Gym memberships are through the roof. But it's about the middle of March now, and it's amazing how quiet it is now in the gym compared to what it was when I started the year. And the reason why is by human nature, we get excited, listen, at the thought of something new. We get excited about, oh, a new land we're going to conquer or a new area of our life that we're going to be able to experience and a new level with Jesus that I'm going to be able to experience. We come into church service and the anointing's flowing. We come to the altar and the oil is flying and the tears are flying and the snot's flying and we're all juiced up and we leave church service and we're like, Jesus, I'll never leave you. Oh, Jesus, I'm going to the next level. And then you wake up the next day and everything settles down and the dust settles and life kicks back into gear and then you realize the same problems are there the same issues are there that same old job is there that same house is there and then you realize man i gotta put some effort into this this is gonna cost me a little more than i'm willing to pay this is gonna hurt i don't want to let go of that now church i was ready man jesus i was throwing it at the altar you know, listen, I've been, been pastoring for 25, I've seen, a, listen, I've seen drugs on the altar, I've seen bags on the altar, 
I've seen cigarette packs and dip cans and you name it. <laughs> People throw, and I don't know what, the, I never did that. I mean, if you want to do that, that's fine. You know, I, I do remember when I got saved, I was driving down the road and I was like, Lord, I'm giving it up. And I threw a pack of Marlboros out the window only to find myself about a quarter mile down the road, stopping the car, turning around and going back and trying to find it. It's a true story. <laughs> I did that. And I found them. <laughs> hey, listen, I got, deli- Lord delivered me, but I... But we do that. I, it's an emo- Listen, and the reason why I give that example is because we get all emotional, man. You know? And, and this, this is a good one. This is, this is a, you got to be mature to handle what I'm getting ready to say here. This is a big one. Pastor, anything you need me to do, man. I'll call clean toilets, man. And I'm like, I just want you to come to church two weeks in a row. That's all I want. <laughs> Listen. I know you want to take down Goliath, but first the lion and the bear. Amen. I know you want to do this. This is awesome, but it's a process, and you've got to start being faithful with the two talents, the three talents, before you get to the five. It's not that I don't want to see it happen, but I've been in this long enough to realize there's, there's a process. Are you, listen, laying aside every weight, every sin, every offense, See, some of you are offended over something that happened years ago in the residency that that offense has taken up in your mind is holding you back from going to the next level. Somebody that hurt you and they forgot about it and you still can't get over it and you can't take that with you to the next level. How many in here has ever been through a, a spiritual purging before? How many has ever been through a purge? You've purged your home. You've purged your home. How many has ever purged their refrigerator? It's like, man, I'm glad I did. That was getting ready to get up and walk out of the refrigerator. Come on, who's purged your refrigerator before? Listen, hey, I'm Mr. Clean, and I've purged my refrigerator before. And I'm like, <clears throat> expires April 2003. What? How did, where, how did, where did that, how did they, that stay in there that long? You've purged your closet. Who near has ever purged their closet, purged their clothes? This last year, man, I purged so much, and it felt good. If I haven't wore that in six months, get rid of it. Bless it. I give it to Helping Hands in West Terre Haute. Bless somebody with it. Bless something with it. Purge it. So you all know what it's like to go through a purging, right? Okay? How about a spiritual purging, though? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 tells us this it says since we're sounded about surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us lay aside now am i reading this right i want to make sure is that the word every is that the word every it doesn't say some or part or a percentage what's it say let's all say it together say every every When you read Hebrews chapter 12, now it's following Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 lists the hall of fame of faith and it lists all those through scripture who are giants of the faith. And it gives their testimony. It talked about what they went through and the persecutions they went through. And and then as chapter 12 comes along, it says, we are compassed about with such a great cloud. Those witnesses are are those that are mentioned in chapter 11. And the Bible is saying, you want to do something great for the Lord. And when you look at that list, you, you look at some people that... You know, really, when they began their journey, they weren't real righteous people, you know. But God put them in the hall of fame of faith. And we look at our lives and we say, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to achieve. I want to do these great things for the Lord. And the Lord says, what you need to do is study the life of these witnesses. Look at their life because this is what they had to do. If you want to keep running this race, you got to lay aside every weight Every single one, you got to do some purging in the sin that does so easily. That's another word. Say easily. So the Lord says every way, but then he says these are easily. They easily beset us. What's that mean? Sometimes it's easy to let these things back in our life. 
Sometimes it's, it's hard to let them go because we don't realize that we thought we did a purging and they're still there. He says, the reason why I want you to do this is because I want you to run with patience the race, your destiny. God has called every single one of you to go to another level in your walk with him. Every one of you that's in here today, God wants to use you to a greater degree. None of us in here have seen the fullness of God's glory as he intends for all of us. None of us. None of us have exercised every single thing in us, all of our time, all of our talent, and all. None of us have gotten there yet. And I want to get to the place that when my life is over, I can have the same testimony as the Apostle Paul. I finished my race. I did it. I left nothing more out on the table. I've laid aside every weight. I've laid aside every sin that has so easily beset me. I've ran with ra- this, this race with patience and every level that God was calling me to. I was ready to let go of anything or anybody that would hold me back. I had to do it. Anybody who's ever been through the process of purging knows how painful it can be. However, if you've never experienced it, you better hold on. Why? Because it's part of the process. And if you've never had to go through purging before, you will. John chapter 15. Let's look at this. Oh, you will. Purge is defined as this. I want to look at John 15 verses 1 through 5. The word purge means this. To be free from impurities. To purify to remove by cleansing, to get rid of sin, get rid of guilt, defilement, get this, or to be empty. Purging can be an emotionally painful process, and sometimes it comes with immense pressure. Can I get an amen on that? When God runs you through a cleansing or a purging process, things will become a little bit more illuminated, a little bit clearer in your life, you began to start to see exactly why God had to purge it. If it's pride we need to be purged of, you'll run into some prideful situations that will force you, hear me, force you to deal with it head on. Because this is the thing about purging. Get this. God won't remove it if you don't want to let go of it. Change is a choice. Purging is a choice. You have to do what you can do. And once you've done all you know to do, rely on the grace of God to empower you to keep moving forward. And God will give you the grace you need. He'll give you the strength you need to go through that purging. But if it's pride, you'll have to confront it. Why? God will put you in a situation. Isn't this amazing how God does this? If it's unforgiveness, God will force you to have to deal with someone you can't forgive. Because that's the only way it can be purged. Jesus said it's easy to love those who love you. But to love those that don't? Oh yeah, that's Christ-like. But you don't know how your love is or you don't know what needs to be purged. You don't know if you're dealing with those things that are weighting you down unless you're put in a situation to be confronted with it. I want you to hear me. Sometimes when these situations happen, don't be blaming Satan. Be thanking God he brought it to your attention because you don't know what needs to be purged unless you're confronted with the situation and then you see how you respond, how you react. You you think of how your mind is responding to it and how your emotions are acting up and then you have to tell yourself, you know what, I did not know that was there. Maybe that's what's been holding me back. And until I was put in this situation, I didn't know I needed it purged. I mean, how do you know you're struggling with pride if you're not confronted with a situation where your pride will be tested or your forgiveness or your offenses or your love? Whatever it is, you can fill in the blank, but the Lord is going to make sure that he brings it to your attention. Because when God's purging us, it means that he wants us free. Think about this. When God is purging you, look at it on the bright side. God's wanting to heal you. God's wanting to purge you. Listen, God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. Man, I was born this way. Yeah, that's why you got to be born again. You know, I I hear people say, 
That's serious, you know. Secular artists sing the songs and you, you hear it. And there's just such a push nowadays. You know, accept me. Accept me for who I am. I, I love you for who God created you to be. But God loved you too much and redeemed you from what you got going on. That's why you got to be born again. We got this attitude that, you know, God just loves me just the way I am. Listen, God loves you, but that's why Jesus died and you have to be born again. And in order to be Christ-like, you got to let go of those things that aren't like Christ. If you want to get to the next level, 2 Timothy 2.21 says, if you keep yourselves pure. Let's put that, I'm sorry, I had John 15. Let's look at this real quick before we go to John 15. If a man therefore purge himself from these, here's the word purge. You got to release these things. It says, if we can do that, now we are a vessel of honor. Now we've put ourselves in a position that God can use us as we go to the next level. Are you seeing this? A vessel of honor, sanctified, and here it is, meat for the master's use. Prepared unto every good work. This is how you have to see this. In its simplest of explanations, is this is where I am. These steps represent different levels that the Lord wants to take me to. Up here is where I can be a vessel of honor. Up here, God desires to use me. God wants to work through me. God wants those giftings and, and those things that he poured into me even before I was born. Those natural talents and then those spiritual giftings that came to me when I received the Holy Ghost. God wants all those things to be released through me because that's why I'm created. I was created as his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's why I'm here. I'm not on this planet to do my own thing, build my own kingdom, chart my own course. I am here to do the will of the one who created me. That's what Jesus said. I'm not here to do my own will. I'm here to do the will of the one who sent me. So right up here is that next level. That's where God wants you. But some of us, we keep hanging around at the bottom of the mountain. And Scripture says, listen, as you see the progression of verse 21, if you read it in reverse, what it's saying is, I'm not meat for the master's use. I'm not prepared for the good work God wants in me if I choose not to purge myself. Because if I don't purge myself, I can't be a vessel of honor. I can't be sanctified. What's, what's that mean? That just means set apart. So you got to, when God sets you apart, when he sanctifies you to be the vessel he wants to use for you in that separation process, he's going to separate things and people. He has to. But you won't be the vessel God called you to be. John chapter 15. This is what Jesus said. Are you getting this? He said, every branch in me that bears fruit. This is okay, that word purge again. It's the same definition. Get this. Well, at first he says, if you don't wear, bear fruit, he's going to take you away. And this is what he says. Every branch that bears fruit. How many of you have ever been through some stuff and you're like, Lord, when are you ever going to let up? Come on, let me see. Who's, you, can I see some hands? Who's ever been there? You're like... Man, I, it's, like, it's like, it's like, Lord, do you, Lord, do you understand how long it took me to get here? <laughs> and I got to go through this again. I've been, I've been around this mountain enough. But this is what the Bible says. The Bible says if you're bearing fruit, notice, he's going to purge you again. <laughs> Lord, you don't realize how hard it was to give this up. You don't know how hard it was to walk away from this relationship or this situation. You don't get it, Lord, do you? And, and Jesus is like, listen, I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. I see potential in you. I see a warrior. I see a gifted vessel that I want to use for my honor. But you're not there yet. I got to do some more purging. But you know what that verse explains to me? God sees so much potential in me even when I don't. Amen. Amen. Even when I don't see the magnitude that the Lord wants to use me, 
Jesus looks at me and says, mm, you're bearing fruit. I got some more. I got a purse. But God, how much more? I mean, some, really, seriously, some of us are like, what have I been serving you for 30 years? How much more can you purge? I, you know, I've been a member, you know. I'm a member of the Tarot Church of God now. I tie. I mean, get, we go down the list. We're like, okay, Lord, I come to church. You know, I come to church. I, I pay my tithes to the penny, man. That's awesome. Gross. <laughs> and and then, you know what I mean? I said, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those, Lord. I mean, I said, gross, yes. <laughs> you know, even gift and tax checks, man. I'm, I'm tithing. I give it offerings. I volunteer. Man, I, I, man I, what more can you purge out of me? I don't drink, cuss, or chew, or hang around with those that do. <laughs> you know, what, what more? And the Lord's like, mm, you can't see it. You're blind to it. Why? Because you haven't let go of it yet. It's weighting you down. It's blinding you from seeing just how much damage it's bringing to you. Has anybody in here heard the Lord want to purge something in your life and you're like, Lord, I don't understand this. I'll let my wife use this as her own testimony. When the Lord called, when the Lord brought us together and called her to move away from where she lived for over 20 years, where all of her family, all her friends, her job, her home, everything. And Mima did the same thing. And the kids had to come with Jovi. So all, and it's like, Lord, you moving us nine hours away? In a good city. In a good church. Better church than this one. And I'll admit that. Big church doing great things. And it's like, Lord, what? what? You're calling me to have to leave everything? And it's because even, listen, even good things can be weighted things when God says the season's over. Season's over. I'm transitioning you into a new season. Because we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. We start playing the comparison trap and we're like, but Lord, and God says, I don't see things as man sees it, man. Because it's the act of holding on to what's no longer your season that will cause you to die. And God's saying, I got a whole new level I need to take you through, but you got to let go of even some good things, even some good things in order to get to where I want you to be. Is this making any sense with anybody? John 15. Let's, Let's revisit this. I'll close here in a little bit. In a second. (laughs) Every branch that bears fruit, I want to purge it so you can bring forth more fruit. That's the goal. That's the goal. This is what the Lord's saying. I'm not satisfied with what you're doing with me now. I see more that you can produce. (laughs) Has anybody ever been stretched by God and you're like, I can't be stretched anymore? (laughs) This is what God's saying. It's okay. You won't break. My grace is sufficient. But Lord, I don't like this thorn in my side. Please take it away. Mm, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna endure this season. It's okay because my grace is sufficient. I'll see you through. Because my strength will be made perfect in your time of weakness. This is why God does what he does. So when you do get here, listen. That's what he told Paul. So when you get here, get this. When you do arrive, your testimony will be this. Had it not been God, I could have never have done this. Where I'm at, what I'm doing, what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, this is a testimony to the fact that only God could have seen me through this to get me here. Because if you got where you are because of your strength, who's going to want the glory? Who's going to want the attention? Who's going to want the credit? 
If it was easy, you would want the credit. And if it was easy, everybody would be at that level. God wants the glory and he wants to purge you to get there. He says, now you're clean through the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. A branch cannot bear fruit of itself except that abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same forth brings forth much fruit. So at first it was more fruit, now it's much fruit. For without me, here it is. Without me, you'll never get to this level, ever. You can do nothing without me. Tony Gaskin said, separation before elevation. Write that down. Separation before elevation. I love that quote. He went on and said this. He said, you have to let some people and some things go so you can get to the next level. And what that teaches us is pruning is the process that God uses so you can be healthy and productive. Never forget whatever others see as you manifest that more fruit, what others see is a reflection of what's really going on on the inside of you. Fruit never lies, ever. And so in order to bear the kind of fruit that the Lord wants you to bear, you've got to let God take you through this pruning process. It is God's will. And it is a process. God wants to use you and me for his glory, but we've got to lay aside anything that would stand in the way of us getting to where he wants us. And then I want to get to this next point. So we can't take everything or everybody with us. Let me close with this thought. I won't spend as much time on this. Stop being a victim. Victims don't come to the next level. How do I know if I'm a victim? Write these things down real quick. This will let you know. These are sign, four signs that will let you know that you're stuck in a victim mentality. So you got to understand, victim mentality, it might be okay for a while, but there comes a time that in order to go from victim to victor, I got to get some mindsets out of my mind. I got to get some thought patterns out of my mind. See, you got to understand who in here hasn't been through some stuff? You go through something and the enemy whispers to you and says, you're a victim. You're a victim of what this person did or what this class of society did. You're a victim. Dennis Sanders, you were a victim because you were born in, in Paoli, Indiana, and you grew up in a small town with small thinking. And so you're a victim. You're a victim because you were born the color that you are or the economic status that you have or the educational background that maybe you grew up in with your parents. And what happens is we get this victim mentality and anything bad that happens to us, we cling to the victim card to justify staying down here. Instead of saying, I'm called up here. The victim mindset says, no, stay down here. When God says, I want to make you to come up here. Let me purge these mindsets out of you. And you're like, nope, I like it down here. Because when I go through pain, I can make a blanket statement on social media. And I feel a lot better about myself by the more likes I get when I'm crying out for attention. Oh, can you believe this happened? Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Can you believe this happened to me? And what happens is we wallow around in the mud of victim mentality. We blame everybody. And that's the first sign. Here it is. Write this down real quick. Shifting blame. First sign, you're stuck in a victim mentality. See, in order to get to the next level, I got to take responsibility for where I am in life. I am who I am because of the choices that I've made. I am where I'm at because of decisions that I've made along the way. And if I'm here because I made wrong decisions, this isn't anybody else's fault but mine. Mine. 
If Jesus said he'd never leave me and never forsake me, and the Bible says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, then if I choose to keep a victim mentality, I am contradicting the very process that God said he wants to use in my life to get me to the next level and be the victory he called me to be. If we shift blame, how many times have we blamed our lack of progress on someone or something else? Well, if, if, if I wouldn't have got overlooked for that promotion, if I wasn't born in this city, if, if, if I had the right name and had the right, you know, economic status and, and what, what? What? <laughs> You got the king of kings living inside of you. You're a joint heir with Christ. Seated in heavenly places with him. You have the keys of the kingdom. That whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. The king of glory and all of his power is going with you. And you want to blame somebody for being more powerful than God? Who said, I'll flatten every mountain to get you where you need to be? What? Don't give people that much authority. Don't give your past that much authority. Don't give people who've wronged you that much authority to live rent free in the space of your head. We can't shift blame. Because you know what? I'll go back to what I said here a few moments ago. Maybe God allowed what happened. Some of the things I've had to go through in life. I have whined. I've squalled. I've cried. I've left church angry. I've went home and shut the door. Shut the blind. Shut the door to my room. I didn't want to talk to people. Turn the ringer off. I don't want to talk. I don't. I'm mad. I'm angry. I'm upset. And the Lord's got to say, hey, Dennis, before you start throwing stuff, I allowed that to happen. What, Lord, you allowed this to happen? Yeah, because I'm going to make a man out of you. I allowed this to happen. I could have stopped it, but I didn't. Think about this. God could have stopped it, but he didn't. God allows things that even aren't right. Doesn't mean he's the author. You got to hear me. Doesn't mean he's the author. Paul said, a messenger of Satan has come to buffet me. Take it away. And God says, I ain't taking it away. But it's a messenger of Satan. This is darkness. This is, this is, this is wrong, Lord. You're, you're the God of light. I didn't author it, but I'm not going to intervene on this one. But my grace will give you strength to get through it. There you go. (laughs) Thanks, God. It's because God's doing something deeper. Let me hurry. I got to wind this down. We shift blame. Number two, we repeat our story over and over and over and over and over again. Now, I want to say this. I don't want anybody to misunderstand me. I'm a shepherd. I'm a pastor. The last few days, I've, I've met with a, a number of you. And you've, you've shared things with me and I've shared things with you. That's not what I'm talking about. We have to. We've got to confess false to one another. We've got to be able to connect and share. And, and the Bible says that we, that we mourn with those that mourn. And so, I, listen, I get that. This is the problem. If you keep repeating the story a year from now, two years from now, five years, and it just... It is a broken record that God has provided a way of escape, a a way to bring healing, and you just keep repeating it over and over and over again. You are stuck with a victim mentality. And see, I'm not pointing any fingers at anybody in here because I've done it. I've done it. 
And I've had some things happen to me that I feel like I ought to be. Lord, I ought to at least squeeze another year out of telling this story. Because <laughs> that's, that's a good story, Lord. Those are some great bruises. Let me show them to somebody who hasn't seen them yet. See my bruises? But Lord, they haven't heard. They haven't seen them yet. But I took those stripes to heal you. I healed you this two years ago. What are you doing? Wanting to show bruises that aren't there. I thought you said you wanted healing. I did. I thought you said I healed you. You did. Then why are you talking about it over and over again? I thought this issue was dead. Why do you keep grabbing a shovel out and, and redigging back up something that's, that's dead and buried? You got to understand when Jesus showed up at Lazarus' tomb... You know, when Mary and Martha came to meet Jesus and, and they were mad at Jesus and the Bible says he showed up on the fourth day. It was because according to Jewish tradition, you are allowed three days of mourning. On the fourth day, you're supposed to move past it. Jesus showed up on the fourth day and they got mad at Jesus. And Jesus showed up to prove I'm the resurrection and the life. And when I speak his name, he'll come out of the tomb. But how dare you not believe me just because I didn't handle this the way you thought I should have handled it. You're still out here mourning. A day after, your season of mourning's over. Some of you will let that settle in here in just a second. Repeating your story. This is what happens. We feel the need to tell everyone about who or what has wronged us. Feeling the need to keep posting about it on social media. This is how we know that we've been in the pattern. But yet we don't do anything to help heal us or get us out of the situation. You want to know why some people refuse to get their healing? You're going to have them talk about it. I mean, think about it. Some people love their drama. Why? Because it gives them something to talk about. I like the attention drama brings me. If I get healed of this drama, I'm not going to get that attention anymore. But don't you want healing? Yeah. You want to go to the next level? Yeah. You're going to have to let it go. Number three, an ongoing belief that everybody's against you. Guilty as charged. All that does is lead to paranoia. And then when God brings somebody in your life that genuinely is there to care, we don't want to open up. We keep the walls up. See, if you think everybody's out to hurt you, you're going to leave the walls up. And let me tell you, after 25 years of pastoring, you better believe those walls have been up a lot of different times. And there's times I've built those walls. Up. You said you'd never leave me. You stabbed me in the back. You said you were going to be here. You said, you said that you were a member now and you weren't going to leave me. And you said this, and you, you said you'd always be there for me when I needed you, but man, you lied. Why'd you, why'd you say that about me? Why, why'd, you, why'd you do that? And then the next person that the Lord brings in my life, instead of seeing them, I see the face of the person who hurt me. I'll hear certain words. I'll be around a familiar setting, and all of a sudden those old memories come back up, and now I'm paranoid that everybody's out to get me you ever done that before you ever get around somebody who reminded you of somebody that hurt you and immediately without even knowing who they are you're like hey how you doing i don't like them they got the same nose as that guy that hurt i don't like you had that same voice i don't like that he's <laughs> I'm not talking about discernment. Sometimes you get around people and the Holy Ghost is like, eh, nah, nope. No. Number four. We'll close with this. A feeling of being powerless to move on. That's really where it, that's really where it gets us. I can't go to the next level, Lord. I don't have the strength and the power to do it. Church family, through my life, let me close with this statement. Stuart, come on up. Help me shut up.
There's a national ministry that I have received from through the years, had great respect for, who went through something a few days ago. And what I'm seeing out of them on social media is just breaking my heart. I wrote on their wall this week and I, and, and I, I told them, I put their name and I said, you need to understand you're not a victim. You're reacting. You're not handling this right. You're not a victim. And what has happened is they've used this pain, this victim status, to try to catapult the popularity of their ministry. And I'm like, we're not supposed to do that, are we? Are, are, are we supposed to hold on to our victim status in hopes that it might open doors for us? You ever hear Jesus go on about Judas after Judas betrayed him? Did you ever hear Paul go on about Demas when Demas forsook him? Me neither. Throughout my life, I've been lied about, cheated on, cheated on literally. I've been hurt, I've been bruised. My name's been drugged through the mud. I've been talked about. Thank goodness those earlier years in ministry there wasn't social media. Because social media has really created such a platform for that. You can't defend yourself on social media. I mean, somebody says something, it's like, well, it's, well, it's true. I read it on the intranet. <laughs> and through the years, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to want to be a victim. And I know what it's like to have to give up things. Dreams. My will. But when the day is over, no matter what I've had to go through and experience, no matter what relationships that the Lord has cut off that were unproductive in my life, no matter what things the Lord has told me to give up for His kingdom, I know without a shadow of a doubt, on March 17th, 2019, at afternoon, I'm not going to let you know what the time is. As I stand here before you, I am smack dab in the center of God's will. I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm pastoring where I'm supposed to pastor. I'm living where I'm supposed to be living. I'm married to who I'm supposed to be married to. I'm living in the city that God called me to live in. And that right there allows me to look at what I've had to go through to get here and say, I count it all as loss. Dung, Paul said, dung. For the excellency of knowing Christ and the fellowship of his sufferings. And I know that if the sky split today, and I was caught up in the air to meet all the other saints in the clouds to stand before Jesus. I know that none of that's going to matter. The only thing that matters, son, you were faithful over the little. I will make you ruler over much. Enter and toward the joy of the Lord prepared for you because you weren't ashamed to let go of some things and to let go of some people. Stand with me.